Amen. The past couple of weeks, right, we've been dealing with this incredible conversion of Saul. And then there was told to us through the Spirit that there was peace and people were being edified and built up by the love of Christ. Why did they have peace? Well, because their main enemy was now on their team. You got an enemy? Yeah? There's people that come against you? Oh, imagine if they were on your team. Also, we need to believe by faith that God can do it. God can change the heart of any man. He changed mine. He changed yours. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to change directions, to come back to Peter. I don't think Peter's sad. Hey, you were writing about me before. Where, where, where'd I go? Why are you focused on Stephen? And so he never, never said that. He just continued doing what he was doing. And what was he doing? Well, let's remember first the Gospels, Peter. Always putting his foot in his mouth. Always prideful. Oh, Lord, if all these others deny you, I won't do that. I'm with you, buddy. And, of course, he denied the Lord three times. But what did the Lord do? The Lord restored him. Peter, are you fond of me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter was restored. In the same manner that he had denied, he got restored. And Peter, after Pentecost, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and make no mistake, the New Testament Peter was gone because now the Holy Spirit had taken up residence in Peter. Fully empowered by the Holy Spirit, he stands up and preaches a message of fishermen. A smelly fisherman preaches an incredibly eloquent sermon. But the power, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Their hearts are convicted. 3,000 people got saved. And then we see him later in Acts 4 with John. And they come across a lame man and they tell him by faith, he, he's given the gift of supernatural faith and he says, get up and walk. And the man does. He'd been crippled from birth. And then Peter's fame was growing so wide. You remember we read how people would bring the sick and try to get the sick person in Peter's shadow, that if just his shadow got near him. But Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, wasn't swayed by that. He wasn't filled with pride because all glory now is going to God. And we're going we're gonna to see Peter again used in much the same way Two incredible miracles. One, a healing of a bed, bedridden person who had been paralyzed for eight years. Just start thinking about that. Eight years bedridden. And then there's going to be a, a good woman who gets sick and dies. And the Lord chooses to use Peter. And Peter says to this woman, Arise. And she's resuscitated. She comes back from the dead. Incredible miracles written down for us. Things that actually happened. These are historical accounts. It's exciting stuff, isn't it? All right, so let's dig into it. Let's stand up. We're going to read our scriptures. You know what to do. And if you don't, just follow what the other people are doing around you and you'll, you'll catch up. Now it came to pass. All parts of the country that he also who dwelt in Luda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, arise and make your bed. So all who dwelt at Luda and Sharon saw him. Oh, praise God. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. This woman was full of good works. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. They laid her in an upper room 
And since Luda was near Joppa, they sent two men to him, imploring him. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, and all the widows stood by him weeping. while she was with them. But Peter put them all out, and turning to the body, he said, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, then he gave her his hand. And when he had called the saints and widows, and it became known throughout all Joppa. So it was, that he stayed many days in Joppa. Amen. Incredible. Let's have a seat and let's go through this. Now it came to pass. I like that phrase. We don't want to skip that. We're going verse by verse, right? We don't want to skip that. Now it came to pass. What does that mean? It means that God said, and it happened, like we talked about earlier. Biblical prophecy being fulfilled on a daily basis. Don't you often go, I wish I could have been one of the disciples so I could hang out with Jesus for three years. I don't know if we need to be jealous of them because we hang out with Jesus every day and the things that we get to see and experience are incredible. And it says there that Peter went through all the parts of the country. What's he doing? Well, I I picture Paul. Paul was always on the move. Three missionary journeys. He was always on the move, and he always had this desire in his heart. This is Paul. He he wanted to go to Rome. Now, he didn't want to go to Rome so he could see their elaborate cathedrals and all the wealth that was there. He wanted to minister. He wanted to minister to people. And Peter is so transformed by the Holy Spirit, he is much the same, isn't he? He's going around trying to find, he's seeking people that he can minister to. That is not the Peter we saw in the Gospels. It is not. He's transformed by the Holy Spirit. Things have changed in him. His desires, his attitudes toward people, it's changing all the time. And, and it's changing for you, too. Thoughts and ideas that you used to hold dear. And, and then, then you read the Bible and the Lord convicts you and, re- and you realize, I shouldn't believe that anymore. That's not right. God helps those who help themselves. Uh, and that's not in the Bible. It's a nice thing to believe in, but it's not true. God helps those that are helpless. So he's going through the whole country And what is he doing? He's strengthening the church. He's looking for people to minister to. Correct me if I'm wrong, but not right now, but later. Um, (laughs) But correct me if I'm wrong, but listen. We half expect, and we pray like this too, Lord, bring them to Calvary Chapel, Bellevue. Lord, there's all these people out here. Bring them here. Maybe the Lord's telling us, you go get them. And you bring them here. Because he can bring people here. And he has. You know, sometimes a miracle. How'd they find us? I don't know. It's not like we advertise. But are we looking for people to minister to? And and sometimes we can come to church, right? This can happen too. We come to church and there is a time for this, so please don't hear me wrong, that we come and we need to be ministered to. And, And there are times for that. But there's also a time for us to get up out of our seat and go find, because that's what Peter does. He's looking around, And he comes down to this town called Luda, and in verse 33 it says, there he found a certain man. Why did he find someone? Because he was looking. He was seeking. 
Now, Luda. Luda is an interesting town. 35 miles from Jerusalem, 9 miles from Joppa the, in our second scene of healing. Uh, they're in Joppa, and that's 9 miles away. In the Old Testament, it was known as Lod. I think that's a good name change. Lod to Luda. Although the name's not great. Travail or Strife. I want to live in a town called Travail or Strife. Well, we kind of do, don't we? That's, this is, this is the, the world we live in. It's full of travail and strife. First Chronicles tells us that it was built by someone from the tribe of Benjamin, this city. It was people who were taken into captivity from Babylon. These same people, Lodians or Ludians, people from this town, were allowed to go back and help Ezra rebuild the temple and help Nehemiah rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They were Ludites, if you will. It's an agricultural place. Another factoid is if you fly to Israel, which that is on my bucket list, I'd love to go to Israel. Wouldn't that be amazing? Some of you have been. But if you fly there, you fly into nearby Tel Aviv. You don't actually fly into Tel Aviv, but where you're flying into is actually this town. But there's something far more important than all of that. There's believers here. There's already believers here. There's people that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because it says, there he found a certain man. And that certain man, if we look back at verse 32, was one of the, what does it say there? Saints. I want to be very careful because I know we have a lot of former Catholics in here, and maybe there's a Catholic listening uh, that uh, might get offended at what I'm saying, but, and, and I'm not going to spend time like, with all the different doctrines that are not biblical because there's, there's quite a few. But they say, this is St. Patrick. This is St. Stephen. What's the problem with that? The problem is that the Bible says that you are a saint. We all are saints. And it elevates a man. Oh, that's a saint, but I'm not. I must be an ain't. Remember that? They'd wear bags on their head. We're the ain'ts. And, and that's, not, that's not biblical at all. What is biblical? And I love what Pastor Chuck says. He says, hey, tomorrow morning, or even you could do it today if you'd like, Go in front of the mirror and tell that person in the mirror, good morning, saint. doesn't mean you're perfect. What does it mean to be a saint? Because we get that idea, oh, he's a saint, <laughs> right? Oh, he's perfect. It's not what that's saying at all. It's saying that you are separated unto God for his good pleasure. You're his. And so... Verse 33, we see there he found a certain man, just a certain man. Uh, that could be any one of you, by the way. It's kind of a spoiler alert, but that could be you. You're a certain person. And they just said it's just a certain man. He found a certain man. Again, he found a certain man because he was looking. He sought. He sought out somebody who he could minister to. Now, Today, I just want to warn you, I have a lot of very intrusive, pointed, and maybe even prickly questions that I'm going to ask you. Know that I've already asked myself, yesterday at men's breakfast, we were talking about patience. Now, I taught for 20 years. And when you're with kids for 20 years, you learn a thing or two about patience. So I thought, what do I need to study? And then I get there, and the Lord is just convicting my heart because I'm not done with patience, apparently. <laughs> I was saying that we had this sign in our house, and I still don't let God give me patience, and I want it right now. What an important thing because to be patient means to trust God those who wait upon the Lord waiting is patience 
My problem is the, that red light out here. It's only you know, four cars get across 441, right? And I'm losing my patience. But I need to be seeking those I can serve. Let's stop just waiting for people to come. Let's go to them. And I bet, like Peter, that if you start seeking someone to serve, you'll find somebody. What a, what a perfect person, somebody who desperately needs the love of Jesus Christ, the love that you have, the, the love that's been given to you and it flows in your heart and through your veins. You can share that with somebody else if you go find the person. So he finds this man named Aeneas. It means laudable, praiseworthy. That's interesting. I bet him after year five, maybe year six, maybe he was a real patient guy, but after year six, he's like, Lord, I don't feel like my life is very laudable, praiseworthy at all. He's been bedridden for eight years. I think the nurses can back me up here. Or doctors. Any doctors in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? Eight years, that's a lot of bed sores. And we don't know one way or the other, but did he ever get his sheets changed? Did anybody care enough to change his sheets? But he's bedridden for eight years. And he's paralyzed. That's interesting that those two are together. They're paralyzed and he's bedridden. Are they saying the same thing or are those two different things? Is he, because I mean, think about his mental state. I and mean, we know people here that have back pain that they've been suffering with for, for years. And it, it, it's a mental torture that I don't know anything about. And I'm glad I don't know. And we have to ask, like, why? Why is the Lord allowing that? Could it be that we're not willing to wade into that and pray by faith for God to heal? Without qualification, without hedging our bets, you know, there are some that say that God doesn't heal anymore. Well, I say, fooey on you, that's not true. Sorry for my bad language. But Peter, do you see how transformed he is by the Holy Spirit? I'm going to be saying this all through the book of Acts, and I don't care how often I have to say it. You and I need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not done. You can't put him in a box. The gifts of the Holy Spirit have not ceased. They continue. They are still going. But we need to be careful and, and study our word and how they are used. And I notice in both of these miracles, it's really not so much about the person. It's more about others. They get healed and people get saved. That's the goal. People knowing Jesus. Why are you a trophy of God's grace? Same reason. So other people will come to faith. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let my light shine. So he found him. He found this man. So here's one of my pointed questions for you. Another one. Are you and I seeking to minister or are we looking to be ministered to or waiting for it to come to us? Matthew 7, 7, you know this verse. Ask, seek, knock. The original language is an aorist tense, ask and keep on asking. You stopped asking, maybe that's why you didn't get. Uh, seek. Peter is seeking, you see. And the indication is he's to continue seeking, keep seeking. 
Oh, well, I shared the gospel with one person. <laughs> Man, awesome. Do it again. Lather, rinse, and repeat. Keep doing it. Knock, and the door will be open unto you. He's bedridden. Now, and I wonder, here comes another point of question. See, he's bedridden. We, we discussed his sores, but not in graphic detail, and you're welcome. I didn't put a picture of bed sores up there for you because lunch is around the corner. But think about it. His muscles are all atrophied. He, he could quite possibly be very deep in depression, thinking that nobody cares. And un- along comes a man led by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Peter's idea. It was the Holy Spirit leading him. And he's looking around for someone to seek. You see, a car that is in park is very difficult to steer, isn't it? But if you get it out of neutral and put it into gear, God can now steer you. But this is a picture, I think, of some people spiritually. You've been laying around. You got your salvation. But you're not sharing it. You're not seeking to serve. You're not looking for someone to minister to. What's in it for me? And don't you see that's the culture? That's what our culture says. That's why so many now get divorced. Well, it's just not working for me anymore. Are you, are you going to work for it? Because marriage is hard work. Being patient with your wife is hard work. It's a good work, though. She's right there, so I know I'm, I'm watching it. But listen, I can get impatient with her. But the Lord is judging me. The Lord is standing there judging my actions. And I'm thankful for that. Because the world judges a different way. But when Jesus judges me, he brings conviction and I move more toward Christ's likeness. And so when I'm impatient, because a lot of times she has the same idea that I had. I, I was already thinking about it and then she tells me what her idea is and I'm like, Lord, I already thought about that. But that's pride, isn't it? What pride? I already know that, right? <laughs> She's just trying to be my helper. That's her, her God-given role is to be, the, Bibli- the Hebrew word is azer. It means helper. She's my helper. Why would I yell at my helper? She's just trying to help me. How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> Verse 34. And Peter said to him, gift of faith. The Holy Spirit moving, active. This is a gift of faith. Peter's saying this, and I think I'm correct when I say he probably heard this from his Lord. It's very similar to a passage in Matthew, Jairus' daughter. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. That took faith right there. There's no hedging. There's no any of that. And do you notice who Peter, foot in mouth Peter, is giving credit to right away? Jesus Christ. It's not me. It has nothing to do with me. Like, if you're being fed today, it has nothing to do with me. It's God's word. Lord gave me the opportunity to study it. I study it through the Holy Spirit He speaks to your hearts. I get no credit, and I don't want credit. All glory to Jesus Christ. He is amazing. He is my best friend. He's your best friend, and he loves you. And he wants to do incredible things through you. I just have to be willing. I have to let the Holy Spirit guide me. That's one of the things that Jesus said about him. He will guide you in all truth. I can't tow the Holy Spirit around with me. 
no, I've got to find out what is the Holy Spirit doing. That's, that's what we need to do as a church, isn't it? What is the Holy Spirit doing? And let's follow him. He knows what he's doing. No man knows how to deal with this thing called church. And Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you, and then he gives him two commands. Arise and make your bed. Again, very similar to what Jesus said to Jairus' daughter, Talitha Kumai. Arise. My little child, arise. Arise. Amazing. So what does he do? Well, he arises. And, and haven't we seen this? We, we keep seeing this. Arise. That's the first step of every mission, every act of faith, is you getting up out of your seat and arising. And then fill in the blank. What does the Lord want you to do? Arise. And in this case, arise, make your bed. Now that's interesting. Now I am going to get in trouble for this one. So I'm not going to look that way. I'm going to look at you guys. <laughs> but I don't get the making your bed thing. I'm just going to get in it in about 15 hours and mess the thing up again. And seriously, don't even get me going with those throw pillows. Why do we need 43 throw pillows that I have to throw? Like I'm tired by the time I, oh, maybe that's it. But if you're in the military, right, you have a different perspective on, on you know, because you were taught, like you're either going to enjoy making your bed or you're going to be doing a lot of push-ups, right? Or you're going to get to learn to love running or whatever the thing is. Making your bed. So the question is, why? Why does the Holy Spirit, through Peter, give this man these two commands? The first one is arise. Trust me, I'm healing you right now. You're bedridden for eight years. None of his muscles work. And he is painfully sore. Just has to arise and then make your bed. Here's what I think it means. You're not going to be in that bed. When we make a bed, it's because we're not going to be in there. We don't need it anymore. You don't need that bed. So go ahead and make it and just leave it there. There's things in our lives that are like that. You know, we need to, to, to make our bed and just leave it back there. God has dealt with it, taken care of it. And we're just to go in our healing and just walk forward. Make the bed. And as he's making the bed, what was he thinking? Because I believe that he was obedient and he made the bed. Maybe he could even bounce a quarter on it like you're supposed to be able to do in the military. Make your bed an act of faith. Then he arose immediately. Verse 35, so all who dwelt at Luda and Sharon saw him. So it says it all, right? Now we know biblically there are times where all doesn't mean all y'all. It just means all of those that are there. So either way in this case, all means all. They all saw him. They all, this is a small town. And they all came by to see Aeneas, the, the bedridden man, up and walking around, filled with the love of Jesus Christ. Glowing, right? Like we do. Do you know that? Like, Jesus is inside of us. You can't keep him down in there. People see it. Like, there, there is, you got joy. What's wrong with, there's something wrong with you. But I like it. And I want what you have. It's the joy of the Lord. So they all saw him, and that means this all also pertains to the next, second part of this phrase. They all turned to the Lord. Hey, I'm pretty sure that I'm right, and we can ask him when we get there. Aeneas now didn't regret a single day that he spent in that bed. The pain, the sores, the suffering was all worth it now. Why? Because people got saved. Is there anything more important than people getting saved? There's nothing more important. And if I have to go through a little bit of pain, Paul calls it light and momentary trials. Of all the people to say that, Paul said that. 
shipwrecked, stoned to death, left for dead, hated, despised, put in jail. And he says these things that I go through are light and momentary compared to the surpassing glory of knowing Jesus Christ. And we know the Lord. Mm, Beautiful. And so he's going to continue. But first it says in verse 36, at Joppa, a new town, so we're switching scenes, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. Tabitha, it means female gazelle. I always like to look at the name because Hebrews named their children on purpose, right? They would wait to see their character. Jacob, the ankle grabber, right? Because that's what he was. He was an ankle grabber. It worked out. So what does Tabitha mean? Gazelle, that doesn't give us much information. Oh, well, it says, which is translated Dorcas. Oh, okay, so maybe there's some information there. What does Dorcas mean? Oh, gazelle. (laughs) In the Oriental mind, a gazelle is a symbol or a type of beauty. This woman is beautiful. She is beautiful. I, I think she's beautiful on the outside. I think she's beautiful on the outside. But more importantly, she is beautiful on the inside. You see, Tabitha is her Hebrew name. That's the Hebrew word. Dorcas is the Hebrew translated into Greek. But why is she so beautiful? Well, it tells us. She is full of good works and charitable deeds. Are those, don't they sound like the same thing? But they're not. They're not the same thing. Full of good works. And how is a work good? Don't you know that there's a lot of people that do a lot of things that they would consider good but are not good? Psychologists might call that enabling, right? We think it's good. It feels good to us because then, then we don't have to deal with this thing anymore. And so we do something, which we would call a good work. Oh, because it's good, because it feels good to me, but it not, might not be good. Who determines whether it's good? Is God pleased? Worship. I don't like all the instruments. I don't like the I don't. I, I don't like that organ music. I, I want this. Well, I like this. And I like this, and I like this, and I like this. You know, none of that matters. Because it doesn't matter at all if none of those things pleases God. What pleases God in worship? That's what we ought to be concerned about, not the style. And he is pleased with this woman. She's in the Bible, Tabitha. She's full of good works. She's pleasing to God. She's helpful. And the charitable deeds, what is that? That's giving of money, giving to the poor. She's a very giving woman. She is a P31 woman, isn't she? And I'll get to that here in a second. But before I get there, did you notice the Holy Spirit didn't stop there? What does it say, those last three words of that verse? Which she did. I've been guilty of this, and I know you probably have been too. I got all sorts of good ideas in my head for good works and charitable deeds. But then I don't do them. She did them. She was working for others, giving to others. And again, why would the Lord take her out then? She gets sick and died. That doesn't seem fair. You know what's not fair is that she had to come back to this stink hole. (laughs) Absent from the body, present with the Lord. She was with Jesus. Could you imagine what a bummer that is? Oh, Lord, this, I can't even speak. This is, ah, what? (laughs) Okay, but again, I, I don't, I don't think she had a bad attitude when she got here because God just paraded her around. This is the one that was dead, but she's now alive. And if you really want to be alive spiritually and forevermore, trust in the one that did this for me. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they washed her. One theologian says that I found, I'm sure there's others. Oh, she wasn't dead. 
No, she was dead. And then it says they washed her. Why did they wash her? Because she was dirty? Uh, well, <laughs> no, not, no. Because that word washing means ceremonially washed. She was being prepared for the funeral. And so she's very dead. You know, Mark Twain, this didn't go over first service, so this is my, no, I, won't, I won't pick on the first service, but you'll get this. Mark Twain, multiple times, saw in newspaper reports that he was dead. And so he, he wrote back and he said, the report of my death was an exaggeration. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> good, all right. First service, didn't get it. All right, so you'll get out of here on time because I, I belabored the point. I was like, no, hold on. Okay, so he's not really, no, it's not really. But the point is, Tabitha is really dead. She's really dead. But she's never been more alive. And now, so while she's with Jesus, it tells us there that Tabitha had some friends. And those friends went to go find Peter. See, Joppa was near. And, and isn't that interesting? It said, and since Luda, verse 38, was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. My. I mean, no internet, no cell phones to make that news go by, but it happened quick. What was the news? The guy that was in bed for eight years, this man Peter came, prayed for him, and he walked. That news got to this town. And so the, the guys are like, go get Peter. Now the question is, there is a question, because they're imploring him. Imploring him to come. Please, Peter, come. Is it because she was still alive when they left? Because that was the case with Jairus' daughter. And Jesus arrived late, but then Jairus' daughter was raised to life again. So he wasn't late. If she wasn't dead, that speaks of the urgency of their imploring, doesn't it? Please, she's about to die. And we do that. We, we do that. And I'm, I'm not here to say that that's wrong. I am here to say that sometimes we pray amiss. If somebody knows the Lord, isn't it us that are praying, please don't take them from us. Please don't take them away. I can't handle this. It's, it's not good. I, I, just, I, I don't know what I'm going to do without that person. But if they know the Lord, the other side of that coin is they're with Jesus. No tears, no suffering, no pain, just glorious love enveloped in it just all the time. So we have to be careful sometimes how we pray. So they send the two men. That's a biblical principle, isn't it? You always see two by two going out. Why? Because one would quit. One would get it in their own head and say, eh, I don't know about that. But they get sent out two by two. And so these two men come, implore him, and they ask, do not delay. And then Peter arose and went with them. The old Peter, the old Peter, I think he probably would have said, nah, I'm busy. But he's willing to be brought. He sought, but he's also willing to be brought. Somebody needs my help? Okay. And by the way, when, when, when you're doing that kind of ministry, have you noticed that it's not just about never is it convenient? Four o'clock in the morning, yeah? Hold on a second. I got, I've got to wake up. Okay. Yeah, I'll be right there. It's not going to be convenient. Just get used to that. But it's going to be worthwhile. Peter arose and he went with them. And he had come. They brought him to the upper room. The upper room is where, generally speaking, the women lived. Single women or widows but it's also a place where they would go up there to retire. Not, not Florida um, type of retirement. To, to spend the last hours of the day and they would eat up there. They would pray up there. They would 
meditate upon God's goodness up there. And apparently they would also have, that would be a place where they would bring the body so it's not in the house. Because remember, there's a body here. But Peter came. And notice what they're doing. The widows showed him all the tunics and garments that she had made. And that's classic, isn't it? That's, that's grief 101. At our son's funeral, we brought his guitar. I think we brought two guitars. We brought things that were important to him. This is what our son, we wanted the people to know. This is, this is what was important to this guy who is not here anymore. And it's a natural, natural thing. This is what she did. But do you see that Peter is there not to tell and to learn about what she did? Because that was great, what she did. She made these beautiful tunics. If you wanted a tunic, this is the tunic you get. But she is going to be a sample of what God can do. Why did God do it? I'm guessing here, based on what I know about the Lord, but I think he loved those widows. And from time to time, in his mercy and his grace, he wanted to show them that I see your pain and I'm going to bring her back. And he also probably had 14 other plans because that's the way God works. We can't possibly know what he's doing, but it could be that there's people that are going to see Tabitha up and walking around and give their life to the Lord. And isn't that what happened? So the widows stood by him weeping. They were genuinely hurt. They were, they were weeping. I don't think they were, they did have professional mourners during this time where they, they would be paid and they'd just go to a funeral and go, <laughs> I don't know this person, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm really good at crying. So actually maybe that would be a good side hustle for me, hon. <laughs> but these, I think, are genuine grief because of what they are doing. They're showing these, they're genuinely in sorrow. But Peter, he puts them all out. It means ekbalo. The word is ekbalo, to cast them out, to throw them out. I think he did it politely, but like, hey, you guys got to go. That's what Jesus did too. So again, uh, similarity there. But Peter put them all out. He knelt down and prayed. He knelt down and prayed. And you notice he's praying this way because it says he turned to the body. When he was praying with the Lord, he turned away from the body. And now he turns back to the body. doesn't say Tabitha. Why not? He didn't, he didn't turn back to Tabitha because ain't nobody home. <laughs> She's out of there. The premises has been vacated, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. And he says, Words very similar to Jesus, not Talitha kum, kumai, but Tabitha, arise. Her eyes open. Oh, wow. Her eyes open, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. <laughs> I bet she did. Who's this strange dude in my bedroom? Or in my upper room? Like, who are you? Like, because remember, she was dead. And that was no exaggeration. This is a very vivid picture in the original. He gave her his hand, and he lifted her up. And when he had called the saints, there it is again, saints. You're a saint already. And widows. He brought her out and presented her alive. That's probably why he kicked the people out. So that they're out there not knowing what's going on. Maybe he's just praying for that my soul to keep and... You know, those kind of prayers. And he comes out and he's like, look who I got right here, Tabitha. And God did this. And the glory that goes to all goes to God. And it became known throughout all Joppa. I, I, I would bet it did. And it's still famous because we're reading about it today, by the way. And many believed on the Lord. Now I find that kind of strange, actually where we get to the last verse and we close it up. It's kind of strange to me because, I mean, getting healed from 
being bedridden and paralyzed, that's a pretty cool miracle, right? But if we were to rank miracles, raising a person, raising or resuscitating a person from the dead, I think that's up here compared to the, and notice the fruit. In the one, it was all. In the more powerful, seemingly more powerful demonstration of God's power, it was many. Hey, but I don't, I don't care. I don't think it, it's an individual heart, isn't it? Each heart saw. They saw Aeneas. They saw Peter praying for him. They saw him get up out of that bed and walk around. A real miracle, right? There are fake miracles out there. There's, there, there, there are, right? There's charlatans out there. But this is a real bona fide miracle. Both of them. And many believed on the Lord. Tabitha is not sad that she had to come back. And let's not be sad for the things that we go through. Because who knows whose redemption we're being drawn toward so that we can be in that situation, so that we can share the gospel and tell them there is hope and that hope has a name. Verse 43, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa. I think that was by mutual agreement. Peter wanted to hang out there, hang out with these people, all these incredible things going on, this, this uh, joy that was there. And I don't think they wanted him to go anywhere. But it tells us who he stayed with. That's interesting. And that's Peter's given name is Simon. But this is Simon, and the word tells us very carefully that Simon, a tanner. What is a tanner? A tanner is a person who tans hides, animal skins. He's a cleaner or preparer of hides. According to Jewish law, it is an unclean occupation. This person is to be avoided. They are not allowed to live near the city. They're supposed to be like a leper. They have to stay outside of the city by so, so many miles. A woman could divorce her man if she found out that he was a tanner. Uh, ladies, you should have checked that out beforehand. Like, I don't know why you find out that he's a tanner later, but, but that's what the Jewish law says. And here's a rabbi quote of the day. A, literally, a rabbi said this. It is impossible for the world to do without tanners. But woe to him who is a tanner. And Peter's staying with him. The old Peter would have never stayed with him because he was bound up in his religious duties, the law. But now he's under grace and, and he sees that that is being washed away. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that awesome that the Lord's doing that? What a difference. And I'm going to close it with seven things that I see in here that the Holy Spirit impacted Peter and he, and he impacts us in the same way. You know that it might be a, you might be a redneck if things. You might be a redneck if you mow your lawn and find your car. Things like that. You might be spirit-filled if these seven things are happening in your life. You're giving credit to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're no longer taking it to yourself. Jesus Christ heals you. You seek to minister to others. That's an outworking of the Holy Spirit. Wherever, you, wherever it is, all throughout the region, to whomever, your prejudices have been taken away. You're given gifts to use for his glory. Faith. Supernatural gift of faith. Healing helps. Generosity. This woman had that in spades. You not only have sought, but you're willing to be brought. I'm the Lord's. Wherever you want me to go, Lord, send me. You pray before you act. That's a sign that the Holy Spirit's working in you. Because Peter used to act and then pray. You're being washed of false ideas that you have. And last but not least, people are turning to the Lord. You are certain people. We read a story about certain people, just ordinary people whom the Lord had changed, that they met Jesus just like you did, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were transformed. How glorious it is to see 
what the Lord can do in somebody when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. How glorious to see that same work in us. Amen? Father, we just thank you. Thank you for this testimony of these two. Thank you for the profound changes that we see in Peter and the profound changes, Lord, that you're doing in us. Thank you so much for that. Help us to be available. Help us to be, um, Lord, filled with your Holy Spirit to abide in you. And you'll abide in us and we will bear much fruit. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we do pray again for um, the countries of Russia and Ukraine, and we pray for Israel and the peace therein. We pray for the storm that's uh, possibly heading our way in a day or two. We pray, Lord, that you would protect people. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for each person here. Bless them with an overflowing of the Holy Spirit so that we will all see these things in our lives that we'd be guided by you, led by you, and Lord, people around us would be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.